In this video, what is the best heat break for the Prusa Mini? The stock one, the Brussel Titanium, the Bontex Stainless Steel or the Slice Engineering Copperhead. We will use all kinds of tools, including computer aided design, simulation, math and voiding the warranty of my printer. Oh, Disclaimer, I don't own a Bontek and Copperhead heat break, but I scour the internet for information to get my models as accurate as possible. I can only do so well, so please take this with a grain of salt. For this test I use the Prusa Mini, but it may be applicable to other printers as well. My printer had clogging issues and after replacing the PTFE liner a number of times, I got annoyed I decided to investigate. The Prusa Mini suffers from what the community calls heat creep, which is a phrase I don't really like because it's very confusing and easily confused with thermal creep, an engineering phrase, but whatever, let's go with that. In theory, the heat from the heater block goes through the heat break, sneakily, up into the heat sink and causes the filament to melt where it shouldn't. And this can go under the PTFE liner and cause all kinds of issues, especially clogging and under extrusion. Now this is the theory. There is very little factual information about this available because, well, it's difficult to measure inside a heatsink, especially when the printer is running. But we have technology! I modeled all four heat breaks and PTFE tubes and the whole hot end just to figure this one out. This hot end design is not the standard E3D V6, so it's not full metal and neither it is PTFE lined, it's somewhere in the middle, a hybrid of sorts. A number of aftermarket solutions exist to alleviate the heat creep problem. Now let's look at them. Geometry matters in this case. The Prusa Mini is the thickest of all, made from stainless steel. The Brussel one is made from titanium and it has a cutout to reduce the cross section at the neck. The Bontek is of similar design but made from stainless steel and it has a much thicker section after the thin neck to absorb the heat. Pretty neat. I'm not sure how it works in practice, but we will see in the simulation. And the slice engineering copper head is made from copper and stainless steel. Copper being the external threaded sections to dissipate the heat and stainless steel being a thin drawn tube, which is supposed to stop the heat. And this has the thinnest wall of all. And it has a very big blocky section after the neck to absorb the heat also, much like the Bontek, except it's even longer. If we take a look at the PTFE tubes, the stock Prusa has the longest PTFE tube by far and I think this is kind of an issue because when you thread the fitting inside it's easy to over tighten and over tightening the PTFE can deform it over time which could be an issue and cause additional blockages. I get where Prusa was going with this and I get why their heat break is thicker overall because it's not terribly bad and it is a more robust solution so if you ca crash the printer can actually survive it better, it's not gonna get bent, but in my mind it's not really the best option. And also crashing the printer is possibly a design flow of the heatsink. Overall, I have a video about that, I will link it here. You can watch that if you want. I use Fusion 360 to model these, the non-commercial version at that, which means there is no simulation included, so I had to use something else. I used sim scale on the internet, but the benefit of this is now the simulations are public. I will link it down below in the description. You can check it out if you want. Okay, so I transferred the models over to sim scale. I actually had to slice up the Prusa hot end and bond it back together inside the simulation program. This is because simulation programs don't allow you to select a portion of the faces. So I could only select the whole threaded face and that's not really in contact with the heater block all the way. So I had to slice it up and bond it back together, but there are no artifacts or lines along the cut surfaces. So I think the bonding process went well in that and it's assumed that it's a single piece. But this way I could get the simulation much more accurate because I can apply the same size of heat source as the other heat breaks. For the material setup, I applied the thermal conductivity and the specific heat of the materials used. Okay, boundary condition. This is where it's made or broken because, well, as you know, the old IT rule, garbage in, garbage out. And well, we have to get this right. And it's gonna be somewhat difficult. So here's what we assume. There is a fixed thermal load at the heater block, which transfers heat directly to the heat break. There is stationary air around the neck and there is a heat drain from the heat sink through thermal paste. There is a fixed thermal load on the threads and the bottom face. We don't care about the power needed because the printer will maintain that anyway. 
That's why we have temperature sensors, etc. There is stationary air around the neck of the heat brick at 60 degrees centigrade. Now that's an assumption, but I did do measurements. I couldn't get the temperature sensor all the way up above the heat brick, but I'm gonna assume it was around 60 degrees. We also have to input the heat transfer coefficient. Notice how the units of the heat transfer coefficient and the thermal conductivity differ. So the unit for this is watt per square meter Kelvin. Thermal conductivity specifies how much heat is transferred through a meter of material per Kelvin of temperature difference, which is pretty straightforward. It says nothing about how big the material is. And the heat transfer coefficient, there's a whole bunch of assumptions that you already have to pre-calculate to get this number because, well, I mean, what kind of material are we talking about? What is its heat conductivity? What is its thickness? What is there any flow of material on either side? So this is very difficult. I tried to avoid calculating it. So I found, I got the value from a table from science direct. It says 2.5 to 25. So we, uh, let's go with 10, which other sources seem to specify. I know that's a rough assumption to make, but trust me, it's not going to make that much of a difference. You will see later on why. The heat transfer through the thermal paste is by far the most difficult thing to get right because, well, there is no information about this. I did not find anything and we have to calculate it. I found that at the heat break, the thermal conductivity of the thermal paste is going to be the limiting factor. I found this equation for thin tubes on Wikipedia. This calculates the heat transfer coefficient based on material thickness and thermal conductivity. That's pretty neat for us. I use thermal grizzly cryonaut, which has a thermal conductivity of 12.5 watts per meter watt per meter Kelvin. Okay, so we know the thermal conductivity. Now we need the thickness. Yasakawa Solution Center actually specified a 200 micron thickness for ideal heat sink applications. So I think I'm gonna go with that. You would be tempted to just input this value right away, the 200 micron, but this is actually an SI calculation, so we have to convert the value to meters. <laughs> well, that's a very pretty number. Now, if we calculate this, we get 125,000 watt per square meter Kelvin, which is quite a lot of watt. But then again, square meter is quite a lot of area, especially covered with thermal paste. So. When our simulation does its job, it's actually going to calculate with a much smaller area. So the overall wattage transferred is going to be much less. Cool. Okay. Just for a second, notice the difference in value between the thermal conductivity and the heat transfer coefficient. <laughs> That's a big difference. You know, it would be very stupid if someone initially just confused the units and actually input thermal conductivity into the heat transfer flux boundary condition. Yeah, no. <laughs> now that would be the most terrible heat sink known to man. Oh, well, I most probably didn't do that the first time around because I was already... Okay, so here are the results. I did two simulation runs. One with 215 degrees centigrade, which is basically a normal PLA extrusion temperature, pretty high, but is the stock setting for Prusa. And the other one is 280 degrees, which is the top temperature for the printer. Let's take a look at the results. As you can see, the Prusa transfer, the stock heat break actually transfers quite a lot of heat up, even at 215 degrees. It's not really ideal. But all the other heat sinks did pretty well. The titanium is looking very good. On all of them, there is a very well defined mad zone, and temperature is very quickly conducted away. I think looking at this, the slice engineering copperhead is the best, but then again, it costs almost, I think twice as much as the other. Don't quote me on that, but, but probably something like that. And the Bontech and the titanium one are actually doing pretty well. Now, what I would say probably is because titanium grade five has a low thermal conductivity. If you want to push the printer very fast, then it's probably not a good idea to use because it's going to be harder to melt the material with it at fast speeds. At 280 degrees, the temperatures are higher. And of course, the Prusa Mini transfers much more heat. But overall, I think 
the three aftermarket heat brakes are doing very good for themselves. The, there's barely any temperature rise. And you could say, okay, Daniel, but how do you know if this is correct? Well, I cannot know for certain, but I did some measurements. Here's how I did it. I had an air temperature sensor and I just basically jammed it down the opening for the filament. I pressed it down by hand to make sure it's in contact with the bottom face of the heat brake. And I actually did get some measurement. I have the titanium heat brake installed and what I got for 215 degrees is very much in line with the simulation. And I did the same at 280 degrees and it's also very much in line with the simulation. Of course, there is some room for error in this, especially because the printer is broken because I had to take it apart so many times to do this that I probably broke the thermistor, to be honest. I also did another simulation just to make sure I got every info possible, where I assumed that the thermal conductivity of the thermal paste is much worse. So instead of 12.5 watts per meter Kelvin, I used 6 watts per meter Kelvin. This is like a worse thermal paste or worse thermal paste application, so to speak. And what I found that the aftermarket heat brakes did not experience much, much temperature hike in the PTFE tube region, maybe one or two degrees, but the Prusa Mini stock heat brake experienced 10 degrees of temperature climb. So the Prusa Mini stock heat brake is actually much more dependent on the good thermal greasing than the other ones. And this might explain why some people experience clogging and heat creep issues on their printers and others don't. So actually, thermal paste matters a lot on the stock gear. Yeah, that might be a useful information for some people. Let's say you want to upgrade to one of these heat brakes, for example, the Bontex stainless steel. Even though it is the same material as the Prusa one, so it has the same specific heat and therefore costs the same amount of energy to heat it up to the same temperature, the overall thermal performance is going to be different because there is just significantly less amount of heat being dumped into the heat sink. And so what this means is that you have to change the PID tune of the printer, which is just basically values stored in the memory to avoid thermal under or overshoot. But there is a problem here. PID values would be stored in the EEPROM. But on the Prusa Mini, overwrite of that is locked out by default. So that means every time I restart the printer, I have to actually probably redo the PID tune, which I'm not really up for. So this is where the avoiding the warranty part comes, because we will have to break this printer to make it work properly. Now, I know there is a solution for this. It's to either run a G code with a PID tune every time you start the printer, but I'm not doing that. Or put the PID values in the G code. I also want, don't want to do that because there's a bunch of G codes I have, legacy G codes, which I still might want to print. So I think the best solution for me is to break my warranty. The Prusa Mini doesn't actually allow you to override the firmware as it is. So you have to break out a tab, so-called appendix on the board. So I did that. I downloaded Lama Mini, which is a modification for the stock firmware. It has a number of differences, but most important is it allows a PID tune to be performed and saved into the EEPROM. I think the main takeaway is before you do any of this, check if your printer allows a PID tune. I haven't tested it with the stock values, but I assume because I had the titanium heat break that it's going to be radically different. Now, that might not be the case, but since my printer is broken at the moment I'm, and I'm gonna have to order the parts, I cannot really test this here because it wouldn't hold a stable temperature. The problem is not that big. I can still heat it up and test it, but you know, I can only take it so far. There is an additional question about this, you know, these brakes are so efficient that I think, in theory, they could push well over above 300 degrees easy. Not with the stock one, but an aftermarket heat brake, probably at Copperhead, 300 degrees easy. Will the printer allow that? No, 
not in stock form. Yeah, these are just my five cents. So this has been my very unofficial ranking of the heat breaks. I would say something like Copperhead, Bontech, Titanium and stock in that order. Though because of the price, Copperhead is, you know, depends on what you want. The other one are really very similar. And I haven't tested them in actual production and this hasn't run much. I did test it for a while and I think it runs very well, but I didn't have the time put in. So please don't quote me on these. Just, this is just some, you know, advice. Cool. What the heck? That switched off. Oh yeah, it's just, okay. Nice. I didn't look into the camera at all, right? No, because there's the guy I was looking at the screen. <sighs> I'm not reshooting this. I'm most definitely not. This was just such a long explanation. I'll see you sometime later.